my name is Claire and I'm on the Arizona Science Center Teen Advisory Board. Um, first, I wanted to give you all a quick background about the board. Um, so basically, our mission is to re-engage teens in STEM and we do this through a range of events from teen science socials to career readiness talks to teen talks like this um, and then create events. And we're super glad that you could all join us for our very first virtual event. We hope to continue these events um, for as long as quarantine lasts. Um, but tonight you'll get to hear from four amazing panelists, then you'll get to ask them any questions, and then you'll get to play in a Kahoot um, for a chance to win prizes from Whataburger. Um, so right now, if you can um, get a second device uh, ready so that you're ready for the Kahoot as well, that would be awesome. Um, and really quickly, the panelists are Michelle Brunda, who is a licensed social worker, Adam Brooks, a national motivational speaker, Amy Smith, a student support intern, and Dr. Annette Iverson, a licensed clinical psychologist and professor at Chapman University. So next up is Nana, who's going to tell you more about our first panelist, Michelle Baranda. Hi everyone, I'm Nana. Our first panelist today is going to be Michelle Baranda. Michelle is a licensed clinical social worker with a graduate degree in social work from Texas AMM Commerce and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Psychology from McMurray University. She has worked in many settings, including community mental health, substance abuse and addiction counseling, a children's hospital, and in private practice. She focuses her work with adults and adolescents and believes in having a non judgmental and safe therapeutic space for motivated clients to become their greater selves. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this is interesting. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm talking to myself. I have to remember I'm on camera. Um, yes, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I reside in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I was uh, invited and found out about your program through Brianne Loya. Uh, we went to college together. Um, so what it means to have, to be a licensed clinical social worker means that I have a master's in social work and I participated in um, a certain number of supervised clinical hours after my degree, sat for an exam, and it allows me to see individuals, families, couples in a private practice setting for therapy, which is what I'm currently doing. Um, I see a variety of adolescents and adults for mental health issues such as trauma, anxiety, life transitions, um, like graduating high school or college, uh, changing careers, marriage, divorce, um, any big changes in life. So I thought it would be helpful if we looked at a little bit of neuroscience to start out with, I found a great um, picture of the brain and different areas that are developing as a teenager. So let me see if I can successfully share my screen. So, and I'm not quite sure what it looks like on yours. Can everyone see it? Okay, thank you, Adam. I can still see you. Um, okay, so what I like about this is it shows some big parts of your brain that are developing in adolescence. So starting around age 12, all the way up into your mid 20s. Um, I know that the teenage brain gets a bad rap sometimes, which is one of also one of the reasons that I picked this, because sometimes it's easier uh, to tackle something if you understand a little bit about what's happening. So some of these that I'm going to point out to you, um, the ventral striatum, this is your reward center. So it's not fully developed in teens, but what you'll get from it as a teenager is that you're going to be more excited by rewards than consequences. And I'm gonna come back to that later with some of my tips on self-care. So I just wanna point that, that part out. 
Um, then we've got your hippocampus down here. So this is your hub for memory and learning. It is significantly growing in teens. Um, in adults, it's obviously fully functional, but um, in teens, there's, you'll see it's a tremendous learning curve. Then um, over here, we've got the amygdala. So it's not quite on here, but your amygdala is a tiny little beam um, deep in your brain and it's responsible. It's the emotional core for passion, impulse, fear, aggression. Um, in teens, you can see that coming out through being more impulsive. So it's kind of the alarm system for your brain. So it's like, yes, that's a great idea. We're gonna go with that. Um, you can blame the amygdala for, for the times where you do something and then your parent says the, the, the phrase of, what were you thinking? Well, you weren't. Um, and then we're gonna come up here to the prefrontal cortex. So it's the big part of your brain in the front of your head. So it's functioning, it's called the executive functioner. So its functions include planning and reasoning. One thing I wanted to point out is that it is growing up until you are age 25. So in teens, it's going to come out um, as, they say prone to high risk behavior, but it's really because the prefrontal cortex keeps your amygdala and the more impulsive parts of your brain in check. So in your adolescence, that is coming into development and not until your age around 25 does it fully be able to say like, eh, like let's stop, let's think about that. Um, it, it includes, like I said, planning, reasoning. Um, it's your executive functioner. So the other part that I wanted to point out through this is in all of these parts, it's showing adults fully developed. Teens, it is developing. So your brain is doing really amazing hard work in your adolescent years. And if there's one thing that we know with hard work is um, some struggles. So the reason that I liked this example is because it kind of shows you what's going on and also potentially what's to come. Yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Um, so when we look at all of the areas of your, of your brain developing, it can help you understand some of the struggles that you go through in adolescence and also give you hope that it will pass, that your, your frontal lobe will develop and you will not always be getting in trouble from your parents and your teachers. Um, so one way you can help develop that healthy brain is learning how to take care of yourself. So I have some statements that I say to clients often. One of those is, how can you look out for your future self today? And can you give yourself some grace? So really, there's no better way to start learning how to look out for your future self than in adolescence, because you're growing and you're learning how to be that independent adult eventually. Um, so what are some ways that you can begin to look out for your future self? Well, start getting to know yourself. Start getting to know how you thrive. How do you be your best self individually? So looking at um, how do you study or learn best? Um, how do you communicate your feelings and your emotions in healthy ways? What kind of social interactions are you most comfortable in? Where do you make your friends? Things like that. A big one is implementing positive self-talk and statements of gratitude into your daily routine. It can really help decrease 
inner negative self-talk and increase self-esteem. So when I said I was going to go back to the ventral striatum, it responds better to reward as an adolescent. So what better way to do that than from yourself and learning how to be kind to yourself? Um, so in my private practice, I view mental health from a three-prong approach. What has happened to you? How is it currently impacting you? And what do you want your future to look like? So when we look at that picture of the brain developing and it says, you know, in adulthood, all of those parts are going to be fully developed. Um, and hopefully that's true. But sometimes we'll go through things that are very scary, very sad. It can cause overwhelming anxiety or distress. And it can get in the way of those, all of those parts of your brain developing healthy. Um, some of those things may be considered a trauma. I treat a lot of trauma in my practice. Um, so that is when it's important to reach out to a trusted adult, potentially seek out counseling, seeing someone like myself. Um, and again, addressing it while you're a teen, while your brain is developing and becoming its best adult self, starting those habits in adolescence only makes your adult brain stronger and better able to handle life's stressors. So that is all that I have for you guys tonight. Um, Arizona Science Center Teen Advisory Board, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm very excited to hear the other panelists speak, so I'm going to mute myself. All right, thank you very much. So just really quick before we go on to the next panelist, if anybody has any questions, you can please type them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So I will open that up, and if anybody has any questions, please place them there and we will answer them. All right, so just one question really quick. How do mental health disorders affect different demographics of the community? If you could answer that, please. In your opinion. Is that directed at me? Yes, please, thank you. Oh, yes. So I think that could be answered in a lot of different ways. My, my first thought is, um, access to mental health care um, in different demographics, so in different socioeconomic um, communities. I think that access to mental health can be more difficult, whether it's um, numbers of mental health clinicians or um, financial access or um, or community acceptance of mental health treatment, the ideas behind mental health treatment, a positive or a negative. Thank you. And then why did you choose to pursue this career, if you don't mind? Sure. So I think that a little bit of the career chose me. Um, I think that I kind of bebopped through through life and I kept coming to things and getting myself involved in things that were in a helping profession and then just through exploring and speaking to professors and looking at the people around me and seeing the things that they did I started to mold into finding where my talents were and figuring out that I wanted to help people on a one-on-one -on -one basis with um, talk therapy. I don't know if that answered it. 
Okay, thank you. And then we're getting a few more questions in, if you don't mind. So our first one, what do you think is the most dangerous mental health problem like depression and what part of the brain does it affect? So the most dangerous mental health problem, is that what? Yes, what do you think is the most dangerous mental health problem? And then they give an example like depression and what part of the brain does it affect? So probably the most dangerous mental health condition would fall into um, eating disorders as far as physical health. Um, I believe, I haven't looked at statistics in a while, but I do believe that eating disorders is high on the, the um, mortality rate or death rate, which for me categorizes it as high in, in dangerousness. As far as what part of the brain eating disorders affect, that I would have to do some research on. I do not know that part of it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much. And then just one more quick question. What are your favorite aspects about your job? Oh, uh, I love my job. I love being able to connect with others even through the health pandemic with technology, I've been doing Zoom like this uh, for the past seven weeks. And I am so appreciative that it exists, but I can't wait to get back in person with, with everyone. I see Dr. Iverson shaking her head. Um, it is so rewarding to just share space with someone else and provide support and to be able to hear everyone's stories because we all have such individual inspiring stories and we all play such an important part of society as a whole so i love connecting all right thank you so much and then just for the participants if you have any questions throughout the next speaker feel free to post them in the Q&A and we'll get them answered after our next speaker. And now I think Nina is going to transition into our next speaker. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Chloe. <clears throat> our next speaker is Adam Brooks. Adam holds master's degrees in both special education and leadership development and has served as, a, as the director of special education for a high school in Phoenix, Arizona. Adam has trained faculty and staff on bullying, leadership, conflict, and body image. And for the past eight years, he has spoken to patients at Bermuda Ranch, a nationally recognized eating disorder and anxiety health clinic. Yep, go ahead. Hey, I, I mute myself, sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have worked in the field of working with teens for a long time, from being a teacher to working with, uh, I did previously work with girls with anorexia and bulimia. Um, I wrote a book uh, a couple years ago, it became a big deal on Amazon, called The Social Media Handbook, and it's the adult guide to the digital life of a teen. And really, as a teacher, uh, before I became a motivational speaker, I was seeing in my classroom students shifting they were changing um, they were going from reading physical books to actually reading uh kindles ipads cell phones and for me that was just a different thing when i first started teaching i had an overhead projector and a chalkboard so it was a really big shift that i saw in my school in my classroom and i noticed that my students weren't getting happier and that caused some questions for me so I really delved into this idea of what is technology doing for us? Technology we know is it's just a tool, right? It's good or it's bad, it's just is, it's neither one. So we really have to look at what are, how are we using technology now to provide health, provide boundaries, provide 
good friendships provide uh, things that really help us move forward in our life and not things that hold us back. Uh, there's really crazy research um, right now about social media and about our devices. One of the most alarming statistics that I've heard is that 46% of teens actually self-report that they only get four hours or less of sleep a night because they're on their devices. Now, again, this was back when we were in typical time, right? I don't want to call it normal time because I will never be normal. So uh, typical time uh, was when we were on our device, we weren't sleeping a lot. We may be sleeping a ton right now because we are bored. I saw somebody's Q&A say, uh, is sleep okay? Because I'm so bored. I get it. To be honest, I am an extreme extrovert and I am chewing at the drywall of my house uh, because I live alone and I, I miss people so much. So I get it. We didn't really have a recipe when we started coming out with devices or when technology started hitting the mainstream. Uh, in fact, uh, we just started handing it out and kids were figuring it out on your own. Um, you guys were figuring out how to use it, how to utilize it, and nobody really said what was healthy, what was not. Um, and so what we're in a point now where cell phones are, are part of our everyday life, and I am not here to take them away from you. A lot of people hate it when I come give speeches because they think I'm going to tell your parents like, hey, uh, smash their phone or their iPad or whatever. No, that is not, not what I'm suggesting. What I am suggesting is to build healthy boundaries around it. There, there's a difference between actively participating with people like we're doing right now and passive screen time where we're just letting it just kind of numb our brains and we're just scrolling through Instagram and we're drooling, right? Uh, that happens a lot. We sit there on TikTok and then five hours later, we know a bunch of new dance moves, but we haven't really moved out of our seat. We haven't really gotten up and done anything. So we have to really take that into consideration when we're looking at this time right now. A couple of suggestions I've given, a couple of things that I think are really great things to, to try. And I'll tell you, the average teen uh, in Arizona, at least, that we, that a, a, I think it was ASU surveyed, uh, said that the average teen in Arizona spends between 12 and 14 hours a day in front of a screen. Um, that's a lot. That, that's pretty excessive. And so I'm not saying that we can't have productive time in front of screens. What I am saying is, this is not making us happier. Sherry Turkle, who has a TED Talk called Connected But Alone, she talks a lot about how we have never been more connected than we are right now, and yet we've never felt more alone than we do today. And that's a really interesting dichotomy that I can call somebody in New Zealand and talk to them on the phone, but I still feel all alone when I'm in a crowd of people. That, that's interesting. And I think it has to do with the ways we connect friendships are more easily disposable today because I have Facebook telling me who to add, right? Add this friend. Have you thought about this friend? Have you thought about this? And it's usually like my exes, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, nope, nope, remove, remove. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm sure that's none of you. Um, whew, uh, what was I saying? Uh, yeah. The reality is that we have to be careful about how we utilize our passive screen time. Because what's going on is, is it's making us addicted to a false sense of what is real. Um, the reason why Instagram is rated the number one worst app for teens is because it has to do with looks. It has to do with, it's just pictures. And so when I'm following all these CrossFit athletes and they're doing pull-ups and I, who am really into fitness, but usually it's about fitness pizza into this face you know what i mean uh that makes me depressed when i see enough people who are fit on my instagram pretty soon i'm just scrolling going yeah i don't look like any of these people so it plays with our mind it plays with a lot of our, our uh emotions that way so instagram can be a really uh, again we can use it for good but it can be one of those things where if we don't actively think about what we're seeing we can easily get caught up in this I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough mindset. And that's where we find unhealth right now. Uh, we also, uh, the number one best rated app for kids right now is actually YouTube. Because a lot of times on YouTube, you're, you might be learning a skill. 
You might be uh, learning how to, uh, or you might be doing meditation. I, I use it for meditation at night. I use it for different uh, learning facilities. So that can be really cool too. But it's also why a lot of our students have way better makeup than they do communication skills, right? Um, it's because we learn like, I can contour better than anybody, but I don't really know how to have a hard conversation with my friend when they make me upset, when they call me names. I don't know how to build that healthy boundary. Rosalind Wiseman, uh, who wrote the book Queen Bees and Wannabes, which spawned the movie Mean Girls, she has this thing she talks about called SEAL, S-E-A-L. And what SEAL is, is this idea of whenever we have to have hard conversations with people, we have to actually state what happened, explain how it made us feel. We have to affirm that relationship and either lock in or lock it out. And the reality is, is we look on social media and we have people, I mean, trolling is the norm. People writing hurtful things and we see what happens. And I don't know about you, but that saying I used to hear growing up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is the biggest load of garbage I have ever heard in my life. I would rather you throw a rock at my face and wreck this thing than hurt my heart because that stays with me much longer than any physical ailment. And so for me, it's about how do we actually build a network online of people protecting each other with kindness, with compassion. And for me, that's building a personal brand. So if you look at my Instagram, um, I have a public speaker Instagram. Um, adam.lee.brooks. Oh, wait, I just changed it. That's a lie. It's the rooted connector, all three separate words. But on it, I wanted audiences to live, uh, not live, laugh, love, my bad. That can be your quote if you want. That can be your saying. Um, but for me, it's to make audiences laugh, reflect, and grow. So I have a saying that everything on my social media should make you laugh, reflect, and grow. If it doesn't do any of those or doesn't do all three of those things, I don't post it. I don't do it. So I am now creating, in the sense, a resume online that shows you what I'm about. And I think when we have that intentional thinking, when we have that intentional way of doing business, we actually find social media a much healthier tool to use to build our future than simply, uh, oh, that's cute, click post. Oh, that's funny, click post. And now we've posted a meme that we can't take back that hurt a lot of people's feelings or made somebody upset. So for me, it's about building that brand. So some of the three questions I ask are, what are you passionate about? What do you want people to say about you? And, uh, or what's your, uh, what's your legacy basically? What do you want people to remember when you leave? And what are people currently telling you about yourself now? Ask your friends. And those three questions, when you see three things overlap, those might be part of your motto. They might be part of the thing that you use as a personal brand online, right? Um, it, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's live, laugh, love, but it should be something. Um, the other recommendations I have right now for screen time is because you are probably getting a ton of it. I was talking to some friends who are, their, their kids are on school, and, and meeting with teachers six hours a day. That's crazy. Um, the research about screen time says two to three hours max a day um, simply because our eyes get tired. So for me, an hour before bed and an hour after I wake up, no screen time at all. Um, that's my own personal discipline. I don't wanna wake up and just scroll because it makes me stay in bed longer. And then I'm lethargic, then I'm lazy. Not only am I lethargic, but now I want Cheetos. Now I want Monster Energy drinks. Now I want things that are unhealthy, right? I don't want to get up and take a walk. I own a treadmill that I didn't use for a year. But this last month, I've used it every day. Sometimes to fold clothes on, but it doesn't matter, right? It's still being used, so that's all right. So for me, uh, those things, an hour after you wake up and an hour before bed, um, be careful about sitting on your screen. Your mind has to come down off of a high that you've been on a screen so that you can go to sleep at night. For those of you who have trouble sleeping, that can be a big indicator. Arizona for a little while was number two in the nation for teen suicides. And one of the reasons we found, um, whenever I had a parent who said their kid had attempted, I said, you know, how much sleep are they getting and how much screen time are they using? And we usually found they were both pretty high. 
So I would never say that social media causes that, but it definitely is a correlation to feeling alone. And that actually, uh, that with lack of sleep increases depression, anxiety, and a, and a couple other things. So um, I want us to be mindful of that. And um, I think those are some good things. I'm probably past my time. So I, uh, I apologize. I'll take any questions you've got. Um, All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Chloe, so did, I, did I mess it up, Chloe? No. You sure? Of course. Good. What should we do? I'll, or do you want to read the question? You can read it if you'd like. No, no, you're killing it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. What should we do to motivate ourselves to not get on our phones immediately? You know what? It's really interesting. There's a website called humanetech.io, and they actually teach you tech strategies to get rid of your addiction. So they actually recommend that you take all of your buttons that you're used to pushing and moving them over onto different pages of your phone. And that way when you automatically, because if you notice, you always scroll up and then you click a button. But when that button's not Instagram anymore, or when that button's not TikTok anymore, now you're starting to kind of disrupt your brain and you're thinking about that. Also creating a game, right? Like saying, in, all right, in our household, whoever has the least amount of time spent on screens gets to choose what restaurant we order from this week or creating kind of a fun way to, uh, to get us out of this, some of that addiction. So that's some of the things I would do, Jesse, if I was to motivate myself to not get on my phone. Um, using FaceTime more, using Zoom more, um, those are other ways to kind of break that up. All right, thank you. And then one more question really quick, please. Why did you choose to pursue this particular career? And then also, when did you figure out that this was the career that you wanted to choose? That's a very interesting question, Chloe. Um, and I don't have as much time as it would take to answer it. Uh, I am an ADD kid from the 80s. So I did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I got my bachelor's in speech communications to be a motivational speaker. I went to New York to become an actor and I spent uh, three months off Broadway and realized that was not what I wanted to do. Uh, and so then I substitute taught because I heard you could not answer your phone and go snowboarding in Flagstaff if you wanted. And I long-term subbed for a special ed class and I fell in love with my kids and those students were amazing. And I went back to school and I got several more degrees in special education and leadership. And the rest was history. When I was a teacher, speakers weren't talking about stuff kids needed. So I said, I'm gonna be a speaker. And that grew so big, I had to leave teaching. So now I could just teach college part-time and travel and speak full-time. That's great, thank you so much. So I think now Nina will introduce our next speaker. Okay then. Uh, next up, we have Miss Amy Smith. Amy came to Phoenix after growing up in a variety of locations, including New Hampshire, New York, Missouri, and Indiana. Before moving to Arizona, she spent a year in Chile teaching English in, a, in an elementary school and working in an after-school program for children who weren't receiving help or care at home. She attended Grand Canyon University to pursue her Bachelor's of Science in Psychology. She has been a student support specialist at Arizona School for the Arts since January 2020 and is loving the opportunity to listen and get to know all of the unique students at ASA. Please go ahead. I don't know if that was just my computer or if it froze for everyone, but the end was cut off for me. But hi, um, I'm Amy Smith and I am the student support intern at Arizona School for the Arts. Um, I've been in that position since late January and love it and was just getting in the groove when we all got moved online, so bummer. Um, but my role there is kind of, it's explained in the name. Um, I'm there to support students and to be a friendly face that anyone can come to when they need to just open up um, or if they need help managing anxiety, expressing emotions, forming healthy friendships. Um, I'm there to talk to them about that. So I love it. <clears throat> and obviously it looks a little different online. I don't get to have students just popping in my door anymore. Um, but I do schedule check-ins with students on Zoom throughout the week and see how they're doing. And one topic that comes up a lot more than usual lately is body image, which makes sense. Um, I think the body image issues can be easily amplified in quarantine. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit today and just share some tips on managing um, our self-esteem. 
But there's a lot of aspects in the, what we're experiencing right now that can trigger disordered eating. Um, there's a change in routine, change in meal times, who we're eating with, what we're eating, when, um, maybe the presence of a toxic family member who puts a lot of emphasis on physical appearance, a sudden lack of control, which is um, a classic con contributor when it comes to eating disorders, um, higher stress, more time spent on social media, and comparison is definitely a greater issue when we're spending so much time looking at things that have a heavy impact on our mood. Um, a new sleep schedule, a surge of people trying to use this time to get the summer body before they go back. And um, there's a lot of triggers in there. Also just um, being at home surrounded by food all the time can be a trigger for people who struggle with binging. Um, food shortages and gym, gyms closing could be a trigger for people who struggle with restricting. Um, isolation and less accountability, and also a change in um, a means of support for people who are already kind of in the middle of recovery. So overall, obviously the situation we're in right now, combined with the arrival of swimsuit season, puts a lot of people at risk for developing dangerous habits. So what can we do to possibly prevent these issues from getting out of hand um, or just practice self-care? So I have my bachelor's in psychology uh, from Grand Canyon University. I graduated in December, so I am new to the mental health world, um, but it's fun to learn. This is very humbling because I'm just here kind of, I still would like to get more education, um, but very thankful for what I have. And in, in the, the end of my course, obviously I had to um, create kind of a capstone project. And in college, I became super interested in mindfulness and the effects that it could have on body image. And while obviously it cannot serve as a definite cure for serious eating disorders, I do think it can be a great coping mechanism for battling insecurity and low self-esteem because um, it's something we have control over and is pretty easy to wrap our heads around. So kind of explaining mindfulness, um, it is known as the practice of awareness and acceptance of the present moment without any judgment towards oneself or others. So we take it all in, we don't label it as good or bad, um, we just experience it. And because it keeps us from focusing on and responding to the socio-cultural pressures and expectations, which um, oftentimes have to do with physical, ex or physical appearance, um, it's possible that it could reduce body dissatisfaction. So um, the four major aspects of mindfulness are non-reactivity, uh, non-judgment of experience, non-labeling and awareness. And studies do show that individuals who are high in those four areas um, have higher self-esteem due to the fact that they can allow thoughts and emotions to enter and leave their mind without feeling completely consumed and controlled by them. Um, and they're able to come to a place eventually where they see self-criticism as a simple thought passing through and not a reflection of reality. And so, um, enhancing one's acceptance and reducing the desire to control internal experiences, such as those cognitive and emotional processes, um, decreases levels of suf suffering and distress and can lead to uh, one becoming desensitized to triggers and breaking those unhealthy habits. So, um, for those who are intrigued by that idea, like I was, I just wanted to offer up two simple ways to incorporate mindfulness into your daily routine because um, it is a foreign subject for a lot of people. And the first one I'm going to talk about is super classic. It's what comes to most people's minds when they talk about mindfulness, and that's yoga because yoga is a mindfulness based program. And programs like that have been found to reduce body image concern and negative affect while increasing body appreciation which is super important to note because those two negative factors are shown to predict the development of eating disorders. Um, and higher levels of mindfulness are associated with lower levels of body comparison in women. Um, probably men too, but the article I was reading was about women. So anyways, great for everyone. But uh, yoga is known for promoting the idea of embracing the characteristics and the functions of the human body. So how it works and how it serves us. And yoga practitioners have been found to have higher levels of body awareness and body satisfaction and lower levels of self-objectification. So being present and aware of our bodily sensations during yoga reflects the way in which mindfulness focuses on accepting 
um, and giving non-judgmental attention to one's physical experience, <clears throat> which makes it a great way to form mindfulness skills for beginners. Um, and I choose that first and foremost as kind of like a stepping stone into this world of mindfulness, um, especially right now because it's super easy to do at home and you can practice privately and not worry about what other people are thinking as you tune into yourself, which is a whole lot of what mindfulness is, kind of tuning into ourselves. And it sounds super hippie, but it truly can make such a difference. And I believe that's why it is such a buzzword in the mental health world. Um, but uh, it's, it's easy to access uh, the materials for it too. They're all over YouTube. There's yoga specific apps. The Calm app is a, is a popular one, um, even Pinterest. So super easy to try out yoga. And then the second one, um, is intuitive eating. So instead of focusing on numeric weight loss and restrictive dieting, mindfulness values intuitive eating. And intuitive eating helps individuals respond to their internal cues instead of external cues because a reliance on those external cues can often lead to a dysfunctional relationship with food. And intuitive eating is something we're, we're all born doing. Babies cry when they're hungry and then they eat till they're full. And it's as simple as that. But Somewhere along the line, we lose, we lose that. We start to form these rules and restrictions when it comes to ourselves and our food intake, and then we've lost the practice. Um, but intuitive eating is all about, once again, tuning into our internal cues. Um, it's super simple. You notice when you're hungry, and you eat until you're satisfied, and that's it. And there's not all of this like um, eating as a result of guilt or a response to restriction. Um, you just let your body tell you what and when to eat because your body knows when you need vegetables and when it needs dessert and it doesn't have to be this whole mind game of control. And so it's free and wonderful. Um, and uh, it's just a non-judgmental experience of taking care of your body. And intuitive eating works alongside mindfulness because emotional eating is often used as a coping mechanism and escape from negative emotions. But Mindfulness gives us the willingness to embrace our negative emotions without uh, labeling them as good or bad. Um, and it encourages people to be aware of those labels and critical thoughts without getting so involved and consumed in those thoughts. So those are the two. Um, mindfulness is a lot to unpack. And especially when you're first hearing of it, it's kind of weird to wrap your brain around what it is, how you practice it, how can you like put it into your daily activities. Um, but I totally encourage you to dive in and learn more on your own, but for the sake of time and not wanting to overwhelm anyone all at once, uh, I thought it'd be helpful just to share those two simple practices that you can put into place and see what kind of changes you exhibit in your positive self-talk and overall level of confidence. So thank you, and thank you, um, Arizona Science Center Teen Advisory Board, for having me. Thank you so much. So if anybody has any questions, again, please feel free to list them in the question and answer section. But first, can you please tell us why you chose to pursue this particular career and then when you figured out that this was the career that you wanted to pursue? Thank you. Um, I think I was a freshman in high school when I first knew that I wanted to do something related to mental health. Um, and I knew I wanted to start with a bachelor's in psychology. And then from there, I... I've always wanted to get my master's in social work or special education. I don't know which one yet. Um, so graduated in December and would love to get my next degree, but graduate school is super expensive. So I'm working right now, saving money for that. Um, I don't know if you asked why, but I love helping people. I think the brain is super interesting. Um, and I think I would love to learn skills to help other people in general. It's just it's very satisfying. <laughs> All right, thank you. So then the second question, besides helping with internal pressures, can mindfulness be helpful with dealing with external situations and then like the current disruption of our usual, our usual lives? And then if so, how? Oh, I like that question. Um, I think, honestly, I think the external and the internal pressures go hand in hand because there is so much going on around us and we don't have control over the situation and our routines have been completely altered. Um, and I think we can be mindful in so much of what we do, being mindful on social media, kind of like Adam talked about that, being mindful of our um, setting screen time or uh, having 
moments in the morning that are just for us and waking us up, um, getting ready emotionally and mentally for our days can help us manage the external pressure that's so, so out of our hands and creating a routine, creating structure. I don't know if that falls under mindfulness, but I think that's a great way to cope with, um, yeah, the external pressures. And also, there is so much pressure, relating back to body image, there's so much external pressure for us to look a certain way. Um, and I think coming back to things like yoga and meditation, getting in touch with our bodies and learning to accept those thoughts and feelings that come into us, but without forcing ourselves to change, without coming from a place of judgment um, or self-criticism, mindfulness helps with all of that stuff. So. Thank you. And then one final question, please. What would you do if you were numb, like those who have put themselves to a point where they don't feel a need to per se to eat? So how can they help themselves? Numb. I don't know how I would answer that. Does anybody, I'm not sure where I would go with that question. Do any of you have any intake? Yeah. Uh, I know I, I'm a friend. yes, definitely. It's my, my homie, Amy. Uh, <laughs> I, for me, I have gone through intense emotions where you feel everything at once one day and then you start feeling numb and then you want to feel something. So you, uh, I know if we're talking about food, sometimes we binge eat um, or that's where purging happens or other things can happen because we want to feel something or even harm or other things that we can do to our body. And so that's supposed to help us feel. But what I've learned is that for me, journaling through the numbness, writing it down, reading it, um, having safe people to talk to is really a much healthier and better way to navigate through the numbness whenever those things happen. For me, it's not about avoiding the numbness by different outside stimulus. It's actually in and through the numbness through journaling and talking to somebody um, who you trust, who's healthy, to walk you through it. Just my opinion. All right, thank you. Now Nina will introduce our final speaker. All right. Um, our final speaker of the night is Dr. Annette Iverson. Dr. Iverson is a licensed clinical psychologist and practices in Orange and Los Angeles County. She began teaching at Chapman in 2000. She teaches a variety of specialized courses, such as children and trauma, diagnosis and treatment of children and adolescents, and advanced psychopathology in both the undergraduate department of psychology and the graduate department of the marriage, family, and child counseling program. She specializes in children and, tra and trauma, grief and loss, pain management, and anxiety disorders. She consults with hospitals and nonprofits, has created bereavement programs, conducted numerous national presentations, and also published articles in professional and academic journals. Please continue, Dr. Everson. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> I am going to share my screen. There. Well, I'm so excited to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. I love, I just love hearing everybody talk and it's, it's so informative and so interesting. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly to, tonight about the anxiety of, of what's to come. And once we get to, uh, to an understanding of, of that it's safe to go outside and return to somewhat of a normal um, kind of situation, that there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of vulnerability uh, and that it might be helpful to have some tools and um, some suggestions about how to handle that when that comes, hopefully soon. So let's see. I picked this um, cartoon, I thought it was funny, and then I found out that the artist went to ASU, and I thought that was just perfect for tonight. Um, Tony Carrillo is his name. Um, but again, you know, it's exciting to think about uh, 
the world coming back to some type of normal, but uh, there's a lot of unknowns, especially for teenagers. And some teens will be thrilled to go back to school and some will be reluctant. Uh, there may be, uh, they might like having learned to uh, learn online better than being in the classrooms. They may have enjoyed being with their families and getting closer to siblings. Um, some friendships might be different. And, you know, questions like, what's it gonna look like when you're able to hang out with your friends? Where will you go? Uh, will we be wearing masks for a long time? Will we get to meet at Starbucks? Um, what will dating be like? What will concerts be like? What will crowds, uh, Will crowds be okay? And um, what what kind of impacts will this pandemic have on my college plans and my future? And uh, if you haven't thought of this until now, I didn't mean to make you anxious, um, but I think it's normal to be a little bit anxious and to kind of think about that and prepare a little bit. Um, so you probably have seen and talked about these concepts before, but I've, I've learned as a psychologist that a lot of times we mix some of these terms up and that a, a little bit of anxiety and is actually healthy. The research tells us that a little bit gives us some motivation and uh, power to face future-oriented kinds of things. Um, and that fear is usually about current uh, danger and threatening types of situations, but anxiety is about future. And panic often, uh, or panic is uh, usually uh, uh, a group of physical symptoms and a reaction to something um, that's going on um, in the here and now. But worry and anxiety are, are, are parts of our um, normal uh, daily life. And being able to control that a little bit is really important. Normal anxieties are things like um, test anxiety, speaking in front of people, separation, things like that. And it's good to kind of work through those and experience those because what we know is that if you don't find healthy coping ways and you tend to avoid, that can lead to lots of problems. Things like substance abuse and high-risk behaviors, depression, uh, things like that. So the more that we can feel in control of what we can control, um, the better we're going to be. So I always ask my patients and my students, let's look at what we can control in our world that, um, that we can you know, use some of our tools to engage in. So this is my uh, idea of kind of the sense of control where we're looking at things um, cognitively, behaviorally, and emotionally. So that first piece is how we think about things. And anxious people tend to say things like, uh, I need to, I have to, uh, I ought to. And when we talk that way and think that way to ourselves, our body is reacting and getting worked up, um, thinking that way. Instead of thoughts like, I choose to, I would like to, I ought to, not, not I ought to, I choose to, um, I would like to. And when you start to think that way automatically about things, at first it feels a little funny, but when it starts to become more of your normal way of thinking, your body doesn't react to all the what ifs, and I need to, and I have to, and I ought to. Uh, so that power of how you think and your thought processes really makes a difference. Um, behaviorally, I think uh, what came to mind when I was thinking about this talk was, you know, what things can we control as we venture out into our new normal? And things like, you know, we will be wearing masks, so I will be safe, not will I be safe, but I will be safe by wearing my mask, washing my hands, trying not to touch my face, um, uh, wiping down areas, and, and I'm sure there'll be some, some level of, of physical distancing that we'll, we will still be engaged in for a while. And the other thing is uh, kind of our emotions and 
how we handle a lot of that, and you've probably heard this before, but things like we've, we've heard earlier today, meditation, yoga, deep breathing. Uh, I think what I find with a lot of my patients who suffer from anxiety is that they tend to use those techniques too late. They are already starting to feel anxious, and then when you implement those kinds of techniques, uh, it's, you should have done it sooner. So before you get into an anxiety provoking situation, if there's a possibility of that, is checking in with yourself and seeing how calm you feel uh, and perhaps you know, taking, taking some deep breaths, remembering how your thought processes are under your control to a certain extent and how you react to certain things. So the timing of that is so important when venturing out into anxiety provoking kinds of situations. Um, I just wanted to kind of mention that uh, I was involved with the Columbine shooting after the shooting occurred uh, 21 years ago, so I'm kind of old. Uh, but I, I was fresh out of graduate school and it was such a, a amazing and ex an amazing experience and I, it came to mind when I was thinking about what to talk about tonight, even though it's different in, in a way, those teenagers uh, were out of school for about four months and had to go back in. Uh, and some teens chose, chose to leave and go to a different school, and some teens wanted to go back to that school. Uh, some teens were okay, not everyone had um, uh, mental health issues, and some were seeking therapy and things but what was interesting is that you know the way everybody reacted differently and uh how we kind of controlled our thoughts and how we had uh thought about engaging in that time when we had to go back to school gave people some a sense of power and a sense of control and it was a little similar in the, in the sense that once you go back to school school all of a sudden doesn't feel maybe as safe as it used to um, and you will be reminded of this pandemic and reminded what has happened people will be wearing masks people will be talking about it we'll probably have uh uh situations where we where it comes up again where we're talking about maybe if the second wave comes back and I remember when those students went back to Columbine, they also didn't feel safe at the school. And they were reminded by uh, lockdown drills and um, active shooter drills. So those kinds of things, even though their new sense of normal was going well, it would still creep up uh, unexpectedly. And that was hard for some people to handle. And so part of dealing with that is, is this, this slide that I put together about, I, I like to call it my toolkit, where there's seven ways of, of coping, um, seven types of coping skills. And so this physiological piece, like we've already mentioned, is breathing and meditation, self-care, we need sleep, nutrition, and exercise. And then looking at our healthy relationships, our social support, uh, why are we close to these people? Are they good listeners? Uh, are they able to make you laugh? Are they able to distract you when you need to? Managing your thoughts, uh, like those, the, the cognitive self-talk that I had mentioned, and, and the gratitude. Um, managing your life, having routines, having a schedule, setting goals for yourself, and problem solving doing uh, meaningful things that you enjoy, like hobbies and uh, your spirituality, perhaps. And the last one is forgiveness and self-compassion, uh, that you're allowed to, to, uh, allowed to fail. You're, uh, you have to forgive yourself. You have to know that some situations will be overwhelming, but that you have some mastery and some ways of, of coping that maybe you didn't have before because you've lived through some of these recent situations. So I think that was all that I had prepared to talk about. Hopefully there's some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. So one question that we do have, and I think it was a little bit aimed more towards a few of the previous speakers, but if you don't mind ask, answering, how do you stop or control binge eating? <laughs> Well, you know, again, I think a lot of that is kind of cognitive and behavioral again. Um, it's, it's examining the thoughts 
and um, you, you know, asking yourself why why do I why am I doing this? What kind of situation am I in that causes me to do this? And what other kinds of uh, more positive or self caring behaviors can I do in replace of that? All right, thank you. And then, how effective are self care and healthy relationships, etc.? How how effective are they? Yes. Um. Well, I think I think they really really work. It's just uh, believing and trying and being um, convinced and tailoring it towards what works for you. You know, everybody has different ways of 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 what feels good to them and what makes them feel relaxed or happy. And so you have to tailor that list, for example, that I gave specifically to you and your needs. And uh, that, that is how we, uh, how, how we treat a lot of anxiety and depression is teaching people how to cope with these um, types of techniques. All right, thank you. And then being a mental health teen once entering anxiety, how can you help calm yourself down to help bring down the fear? What was the first part? I'm sorry. It was, it's phrase is being a mental health teen once entering anxiety. How can you help calm yourself down and to bring down the fear? Um, sorry, I can't, I can't hear very well all of a sudden. Um. Okay, so the question was, how can you help calm yourself down? And then like, how can you help yourself bring down your level of fear? Okay, I hear it now. Um, how can you calm yourself down and bring down? Well, I'm a big fan of breathing and imagery. Not everybody can visualize. Uh, they don't like it. Uh, but once you kind of know if you are good at, at visualizing or if, if you're more auditory, um, those kinds of techniques, one to two minutes can make a big difference in calming yourself down. And I think it's important to, to kind of know which technique works for you. So you try everything. But I know that when I'm in sessions with my with my patients, and sometimes I'm feeling like I just need to to you know calm calm down and and um, cool off. This one minute of doing some of these breathing techniques and and visualizing for me makes a big difference. All right. Thank you. And then. What should you do if you, due to other mental conditions you have, as well as other things you're involved in, are so wrapped up in so many different routines and systems that the idea of other commitments scares you, deterring you from getting into meditation? Oh, yeah. I think that happens a lot. And I, I think you sometimes, you know, seeing a therapist, it's helpful to have somebody uh, kind of help break that down for you and decide which to tackle first. I think that's a really big thing to take on by yourself. So either, you know, seeking out some support within your support system or talking to somebody um, can really be helpful. All right, and then I'm, this person said, I am studying for a big test and the information and time is overwhelming. So I was wondering, what do you recommend to calm down and refocus? I think, it, are these, am I talking too much? I don't know if anybody wants <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of taking breaks. I, I see my students cramming and studying way too long. And, uh, you know, there's so much, there's so much research that shows that if you, if you take it in small increments and take a break and do something that pleases you and then come back to that, uh, it really, really makes a difference. And I, I think par part of that is just knowing how much time that is for you and not waiting till the very end. But I, I think this online teaching and all of that makes it even more difficult. So it's, it's certainly understandable trying to figure out a new routine. All right, thank you. And now we can just move into some general questions for all of the panelists, if that's okay with everybody. So our first one for Dr. Iverson and Ms. Perunda, since our sense of control depends on managing our cognitive, behavioral, and emotional functions, brain development must be important. Will this pandemic affect our brain development and management as teens, and what steps can we take to develop coping techniques if this pandemic disrupts their development?
That's a good one. <laughs> a great question. Dr. Iverson, I was going to tell you too, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box where you can read the questions. Oh. Because I, ha I did not see that until afterwards too. I'm sorry, Chloe. I was <laughs> like, what? Well, okay. Oh. So will this pandemic affect our brain development and management as teens? So I think, I, I think that this goes back a little bit to what I was talking about as far as with brain development in a perfect world where we have no, disrupt, no disruptions, no anxiety inducing events, no pandemics, no Columbine. It comes out in our perfect formula brain is supposed to develop this way, it does. But then you enter life. You enter COVID-19, Columbine, even smaller things for teenagers, tests, a scary teacher, um, a parent's divorce. All of those things are a part of your story and a part of your brain development. And that's when it's important to ramp up your coping skills. Ramp up processing what's happening to you. Make sure that you're talking to your peers who are going through it, trusted adults, um, and taking extra care of yourself. And knowing also that it's not all doom and gloom. Your brain, your mind, your body, all it will all come through this on the other side. Humans are very adaptable. Your brain is very adaptable. So, Dr. Iverson? Um, yeah, I agree with you completely, Michelle. And I, I think the other thing that I just, that came to mind was about resilience and that through what we have, are going through and will continue to go through for a while, there are some, some positive things that come out of this. And this is resilience and that we, we have, uh, you know, kind of what we talked about those cognitive schemas that we have an ability to come in and reference what we've done and, and use those tools to move forward. So I, I think there will be changes, but I think there's a lot of good things that's going to happen as well in the developing part of the brain. All right, thank you. And then just one final question for any panelists who would like to answer it, please. Why does your brain look so different when you're a teenager? Hot Cheetos. <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, uh, I'll let the brain scientists answer it. I just would, uh, as a teacher, we, we don't learn enough about um, student brains, which is really interesting that it's not part of the curriculum for education uh, majors. And I think it, I think it should be um, because what we see is that um, from what I understand, your brain grows from the back to the front. And the first thing that grows in your brain is your needs and your wants. And that's why critical reasoning is the last thing that grows. And it just takes longer because uh, you haven't seeped yourself in enough life to have made some of those critical decisions. Um, I, but it's happening later and later, which tells me uh, either there's something going on biologically or we're just not having to make some of those decisions as younger as we used to. So it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. But um, I think teenagers have changed over the years. Uh, and so I think that's why the brain keeps uh, developing later and differently. Um, but that is my non-scientific answer. Uh, I'll leave it to the doctors and the uh, social workers to answer that. That was a great answer. <laughs> I think it's the same as why do we look different when we're younger. It's just harder with the brain because you're not seeing it grow. Like you're seeing a baby develop, obviously, because it's on the inside. All right, thank you. And then one more question really quick. One just popped up in the chat. So what are some simple strategies for breaking out of maladaptive coping mechanisms like avoidance? Uh, I get, I'll start. Uh, I don't... Uh, avoidance is uh, a really fascinating one for me. I heard someone talk about this idea of seven seconds. The first seven seconds of, of any conversation or anything is, is the most awkward and the hardest part of it. 
But if you can last seven seconds, you're good. Then you, the, uh, the awkwardness kind of melts away. The heart, you know, the difficulty melts away. Um, I find myself, uh, which is why maybe I am uh, still single, but is saying things that are uh, putting it out there first. Like, hey, I want to have this conversation. And then I'm, I'm kind of being held to that opportunity to have that conversation. So I say it to set it up or I set up a meeting so I can't avoid it, right? So then it becomes part of my calendar, something I have to do. It's like how I schedule in my, my meditation in the morning where I schedule in certain things because then I can't avoid it. Um, and so I think for me, it, that first couple seconds are the hardest part. So as long as we step out in spite of being afraid, um, that helps. I teach public speaking all over the country. And the, the hardest part of any speech is that first couple seconds. It is the hardest <laughs> thing to get through. But once you get through that and you realize you didn't die, uh, the rest kind of seems to melt away. So for me, it's that beginning, getting through that beginning part. All right, thank you. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. So now I think we're going to hear a bit from Don from Whataburger. Sorry, I was on mute, but man, what a great um, thing to be listening tonight and just to learn from um, all of you and get to see that so this is not the way our uh, teen science social that we uh, thought we were going to be putting on tonight uh, would shape up, but um, what you guys are all a testimony to just the power of resilience and adapting, and I think that is something really good that's going to come out of this time is seeing the way that people can adjust. So we're just, Whataburger is proud to sponsor. We know this uh, is not a school year like you're expecting, uh, that you've been facing a lot of unusual things, but uh, we really just commend you for continuing on your education journey, continuing seeking out new solutions. That's what um, STEM is all about. Um, and I, um, I've gotten some great uh, tips, Dr. Iverson and Adam, I'm gonna use that seven second rule. That was, uh, that was an awesome little tip there. <laughs> not the one where you can drop it on the floor for seven seconds, but <laughs> uh, not that rule. Uh, but uh, we are tonight, uh, all the participants that are participating usually would be getting to feed y'all, and that's what we love to do at Whataburger is, uh, is show love by feeding people, but um, obviously we're not there in person to do that tonight, but we will. Um, Lane Seaton said that Science Center would send us information so that we can load something onto your Whataburger app for some free food so that um, you can get that no contact, um, pick it up curbside, um, when you need a break from studying and the different things you're doing. And then I think um, we've got a Whataburger for a year gift basket that somebody that's participating tonight is going to go home with too. So we just thank you for letting us be part of it. And we're just, uh, we're really proud um, of the way that the Science Center and you guys are just adapting to these challenging times. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. So now for all of our participants, we have a quick mental health kahoot for you to participate in if you would like to. So I will start sharing that code. And then if you're unable to have two devices open at once, it's okay, you can change your tab, even if you don't still have this open. And I'll be reading each of the questions so you can answer there. All right, so I hope that all of you can see that. So then as soon as we have several people jump in, I'll wait a couple minutes. And once everybody jumps in, I will start.
Okay, I think we'll go on and get started. If anybody needs the code, it should still appear on the screen once I start the game. So if you want to join, you probably still can. Oh, it looks like there are a few people still jumping in. I'll give it another couple seconds. Hey, Chloe, I really like your background. Thank you. I tried to do the background, but it included my whole face. Chloe, you can actually see all of her. She doesn't get sucked into the background. I was a one big creepy cloud. Yes, I can't use my own background. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Chloe, for being the technology wizard. <laughs> All right, so then I'll go ahead and start the cuckoo. So our first question is, what percentage of adults with mental illnesses receive treatment? So triangle is 67%, circle is 92%, square is 44%, and then the other answer is blue is 50%. All right, so good job, everybody. So we'll move on to the next question. Can't see, is there a next button? There it is. All right, our next question is true or false. True or false, a higher IQ or intelligence quotient is associated with an increased risk of mental illness. So blue is true and red is false. Good job, everybody. All right, so our third question is a quiz. Approximately how many minors suffer from a diagnosable mental illness? So red is one in five, blue is one in three, yellow is one in 15, and green is one in 10. Good job. So our next question, I'll wait for the scoreboard to load. Our next question is a true or false. True or false chemical imbalances are known to cause various mental illnesses. So blue is true and red is false. Good job, everybody. All right, our next question. Which region of the brain is responsible for controlling memory and emotion? Hint, it becomes smaller with depression. So red is the cerebellum, yellow is the frontal lobe, blue is the hippocampus, and green is the pituitary gland. job. All right. So there's the scoreboard for everybody. And then true or false, yearly seasonal changes can impact mental health. Good job. Everybody got that right. All right. So our next question. How much money did HRSA, Health Resources and Services Administration, award mental health facilities? So is it red, a million dollars, blue, $50 million, green, $250 million, or yellow, $200 million? All right. Our next question, a shortage of which of the following chemicals affects an individual's happiness? Is it red insulin, blue cortisol, yellow glutamate, or green serotonin? I keep almost wanting to say like A, B, C, D, but it's colors. All right, good job everybody. 
So our next question, true or false, a high amount of the chemical dopamine in the brain causes anxiety. All right, yeah, that one was kind of a trick question. All right, our next question. Approximately what percentage of teenagers in the United States experience symptoms of anxiety? Is it red 6%, blue 8%, yellow 12%, or green 10%? All right, so it is 8%. Our next question, true or false, a surplus amount of adrenaline combats anxiety and depression. Is it blue true or red false? All right, good job. Our next question, what percentage of individuals experience relief from mental illness when they seek treatment? Was it red, 5 to 20 percent, blue, 20 to 50 percent, yellow, 70 to 90 percent, or green, 50 to 70 percent? And it is 70 to 90 percent. So our next question, true or false? Mental illness risk increases when relay between the visual cortex and the rest of the brain is impaired. So is it blue true or red false? Good job. All right. And then a quiz. How many generics did the FDA approve in FY17? Hint, this was a record-breaking number. So is it red, 2,839, blue, 674, yellow, 452, or green, 1,027? All right, so it was green, 1,027. And then our next question, true or false, many people do not receive treatment for mental health issues as a result of the stigma surrounding it. And yes, unfortunately, that is true. So our next question, which of the following can help teenagers to combat any mental health issues? Is it red, regularly getting enough sleep? Blue, maintaining healthy eating habits, yellow, exercising, or green, all of the above. All right, good job. True or false, smelling chocolate can actually improve a person's level of happiness. Is it blue true or red false? Yep, it is true. All right, so our next question. Half of all mental illness occurs before a person turns blank years old. Is it red 10, blue 18, yellow 14, or green 21? And yes, surprisingly, it's actually before the age of 14. And then true or false, mental illnesses can be treated. Is it blue true or red false? Good job, they can be treated. All right, and then true or false, I enjoyed this Kahoot and I learned something new. Awesome, thank you everybody. All right, so our winners. In third place, we have Emily, congratulations. In second place, we have ABS or ABS, I don't know. And then in first place, Nana. Congratulations, everybody. And then our runners up are Aisha and Ella. 
So congratulations. All right, I will stop sharing my screen. And then I believe Ms. Beth Nickel will close our event tonight. So thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Hello, can you all see me? I don't know if you can see me or not. Oh, there we are. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for attending tonight. I am Beth Nickel, and I am one of the staff members at Arizona Science Center who work with this wonderful team board um, to uh, help plan and organize uh, activities for teens. So um, they do all the work. And there's uh, about three or four of us at the center who help support them with their work. So just want to thank them very much. I also want to thank all of our guest speakers tonight. Uh, a great round of applause and thank you and welcome to you guys very much. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. As well as I'd like to thank Don and Whataburger for being our sponsor this year. So thank you. We do really appreciate all the yummy things that you bring to us and uh, at the events. Uh, for those uh, participants, once you end, I hope you will let us know how you, uh, what you thought about this event. There's a short survey attached, and I think I'm freezing, I can't tell, uh, but there is a short survey attached. Um, so when you, when you click out, hopefully you'll get on that survey and let us know what you thought, um, because we would love to continue doing more of these type activities virtually until we can do them and again face to face. So thank you all very much everybody and have a great weekend.